Thank you very much, and thank you, big crowd that's out there. You're in information overload at this point, I'm absolutely sure. But we were invited to show you what the faith community in America is doing in response to climate change. I am the president and the founder of the Regeneration Project, and what we've been working on for the last 15 years is the Interfaith Power and Light Program, and that's what we're going to, it's a campaign that's a religious response to global warming, and we're gonna tell you this morning what we've been doing and why we're doing it. One of the exciting things about being here and doing this presentation with you is that we have asked our congregations to make very deep cuts in their carbon emissions, and we wanted to show that they can do it. They can create jobs, they can save money, and save creation all at the same time. And the idea is, if we can do it in the faith community, then certainly governments around the world can do it. Susan Stevenson, my executive director, is going to give you a background on some of the, the movements around the world that have happened with leadership from the faith community. So I'm gonna, this is Susan Stevenson, I'm gonna turn the mic over to her. Thank you, Sally. It's great to be here with you all today on the almost final day of the COP21. And we're excited to tell you about how U.S. faith communities are leading on climate, as Sally said. But first, we thought it would be helpful to provide a brief overview of the history and the role that religion has played in American culture and social change. First, how big is the U.S. faith community, you may be wondering. Well, there are about 350,000 houses of worship in the United States attended by over 60% of Americans. About 80% of Americans claim a belief in God. So we're actually one of the most religious countries in the world with a secular government. And in the United States, successful social change has almost always relied on religious leaders and faith communities. From the abolition of slavery to civil rights, when people hear about issues in the context of values, from a trusted faith leader, it can really change their perspective. Faith communities also reinforce and strengthen shared values by providing a base community of support, a community of believers who come together in common cause and strengthen each other's commitment on an issue. And that can be critical since some of these struggles last decades or more, as we know with protecting the climate. Not only was the Reverend Martin Luther King inseparable from the civil rights movement, many other religious leaders, like these sisters, rabbis, ministers, marching, were essential. Often overlooked is the nationwide infrastructure provided by churches, which was critical for the success of the civil rights movement. Here are clergy leading the Selma March in 1965. Religious communities also helped to bring about the abolition of slavery and win the women's right to vote in the U.S. Lucretia Mott was a Quaker minister and a force for both abolition and women's suffrage. The picture on the right is women marching down Fifth Avenue in New York City in 1917. The placards they're carrying have the signatures of one million women who were demanding the right to vote. The importance of the involvement of clergy in these movements really can't be overstated. They brought moral authority and mainstream credibility to issues that had been somewhat marginalized. And it was a lot harder to jail ministers, priests, and rabbis than notorious agitators like Susan B. Anthony. Around the same time as the struggle for women's suffrage was heating up, John Muir was waging a campaign to save America's wilderness. He was deeply influenced by his Christian faith and the sense of the divine he felt in nature. John Muir brought moral passion that really launched the U.S. conservation movement in the United States. In 1892, he convinced Congress and President Theodore Roosevelt 
to create the national park system with Yosemite as the first. And here's an example of moral passion today on the streets of Manhattan. Thousands of people of faith marched with over 400,000 people total for climate action in New York City last year. Clergy have also led vigils around the country. Here they are uh, holding a candlelight vigil in San Francisco to oppose the construction of the Keystone Pipeline that would have brought tar sands oil from Canada through the United States. It's also critical that our public policies are informed by our shared values. We bring clergy leaders to state and national capital, the national capital every year. Here's one of our state leaders delivering comments in support of the Clean Power Plan to Administrator Gina McCarthy. And a new report that you all may have seen pulls from eight years of survey data tracing the relationship between religious affiliation and belief in global warming and the role that religion and morality play in shaping environmental attitudes. It found acceptance of the facts of global warming up for Americans of all religious beliefs. And Pope Francis has really influenced this change. 15% say they are now more convinced that global warming is happening and that they should act due to the papal encyclical. Also, support from evangelicals is up 16% from spring of this year to fall of this year. A real breakthrough. We have a moral obligation to leave our children a planet that's not polluted or damaged. Does that sound familiar? Does anyone know who said that? You got it. I heard somebody. President Obama. President Obama has really embraced the moral aspect of this issue in speeches uh, in recent years. And we think that shows the importance of the role of the faith community in the United States. Thank you, Susan. Um, if you were paying attention, you were hearing that there really hasn't been a major cultural movement in America without leadership from the faith community. And one day, when I was sitting in a pew in an Episcopal church, praying for a reverence for the earth, it occurred to me, the light bulb went on, why isn't, and you can see from the picture how long ago that was, uh, why isn't the faith community leading environmental protection? If we are in the pews, praying for a reverence for the earth, if we say we love God and love our neighbors, shouldn't the religious community be out front on environmental issues? So we started the Interfaith Power and Light Campaign and we're mobilizing a religious response to global warming. Right now, we are a national campaign with 40 state affiliates and over 18,000 congregations involved in our work. That we estimate, and it is an estimation, that we're reaching six million people. We think that we can have a tremendous influence by having folks in pews, in congregations all over the country, listening to a message that they might not hear unless they are members of the Sierra Club. But when they hear this message from their clergy about environmental protection, saving God's creation, we have, we believe, one of the most, um, in, in, in a sense, most open audiences to receive this message. I'm going to go back here to just show you that over, I think I can go back. Can I go back? Just to show you that over the last 15 years, we've ended up with a program in all these different states. They're in 40 states now. They all call themselves Interfaith Power and Light. And there's the map of the country that we are now covering. 
Some of the congregations have installed solar on their roofs, and in Massachusetts, we have a bishop in a cherry picker blessing the new solar panels. And this is a, a bishop who is passionate about the work. We have a congregation in California that has really gone to tremendous extent to be a green building and inform their parishioners what, what the parishioners can do in their homes. They are a LEED certified building. They have taken all the precautions that, that um, or all of the, the uh, requirements that LEED requires and turned their entire congregation into a LEED certified building and everything there. The lighting, the lighting is efficient. The, the low flow toilets, the energy efficiency, heating and cooling, and all being powered by, as you can see, solar on the roof in the shape of a cross. Now nobody walking on the street can see this, but when you fly over, you can see it. And St. Stephen's is very, very proud of the fact that they have been able to do this. And our hope has been that these congregations will serve as an example to the community. People will go home and make these changes in their homes. We also have a program called Cool Harvest, which is the connection between food, faith, and climate. That however your food is arriving at Ramadan, it might be uh, a Lenten series dinner. It may be a Seder dinner, but we are giving the resources to congregations to show that they can have sustainable, locally grown food that is delicious. And again, folks can have this, these kinds of meals in their congregations and then serve them in their homes. Here is the beginning of a straw bale structure that was built um, and you'll see the final product in just a moment, but this are the, these are the kinds of things that congregations are doing. And here you have the worker covering the straw with the clay mixture. The final building looks like that. And when you drive by or go inside, people really don't know it's a straw bale building. It looks like any other building. However, it's sustainable, it's energy efficient, it's healthier, and it's cleaner. Once again, People who attend these congregations are seeing their, their congregations serve as an example to the community, and it's showing them what they can do in their own homes. This is a, a synagogue, um, Jewish temple, that's Temple Sinai in Oakland, and they have done something quite similar. They are a LEED certified building. So Susan mentioned, and I want to uh, say too, that Pope Francis, we believe, has really been a huge inspiration for all of our work. And let me just ask you a question, and you can sort of personalize this. Has there been a time in your life when you have turned to a loved one or, or a friend and you've kept saying the same thing over and over again? Um, as we have been doing with Interfaith Power and Light about it being a moral issue, about the serving the poor people who are suffering the most from climate change. You've been saying something over and over again to somebody and they haven't paid, they paid attention, but not a lot of attention. And all of a sudden somebody else comes in and says exactly the same thing and they go, right on, okay. Pope Francis has done that for us, and it's been hugely exciting, and it's because it's such an important issue, we're not even resentful that Pope, <laughs> that Pope Francis has taken our message. It's absolutely been a thrill to um, be able to watch this extraordinary, religious, humble, and popular leader take this message and go around the world with it, and people are listening. These are the vigils. Before, before the Pope came to Congress, we had vigils to pray that Congress would listen to his message. And people were marching as well. People marched in Indianapolis. People marched in Delaware, all the states in between. And here you have a US state senator 
speaking at one of our vigils. So we are attracting the attention of legislators as well. And as I mentioned, we have programs in 40 states, and each one of those states has an executive director. I'm going to now turn the mic over to Sister Joan Brown, who is the executive director of New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light, where they are doing on the ground local work in their state. And she is exemplary for what's going on in the other states as well. We couldn't bring all 40 state leaders here, but I'd like you to give a hand to Joan Brown, who runs the Mexico program. Thank you, Sally and Susan and all of you for being here. And I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm a Franciscan sister. And not only are we working in New Mexico, but at my mother house in um, Minnesota, southern Minnesota, we have, uh, within the last year, installed a very large solar uh, field, and it was the largest um, you know, private business one installed in the whole southern part of the state. And we've done other energy efficiency things and got um, a, a very high rating with the EPA for our energy efficiency. So it's all wonderful. But I uh, am living and working and very, very deeply rooted in uh, New Mexico, which is the state of the land of enchantment, as we say there. And uh, we say that because um, it's a place of very uh, immense beauty with the mesas and the mountains and the desert and the great cultural diversity. So we work and live with uh, many Native Americans, the Navajo, 20 Pueblos, um, and we have a lot of religious diversity. We have the Spanish, and, and we also have a lot of uh, poverty in New Mexico. And yet, we're seeing the effects of climate change, and also um, our economic situation as opportunities for um, growing who we are and living out our deep spiritual roots. So, our uh, work um, is one of education and of energy efficiency and solar. Oh, okay, okay, great. And installing solar and food and um, public policy advocacy. And here we have a wonderful picture of one of our more recent solar installations, and they are on top of the roof. It might be hard to see that, but you can see the mountains, the sun is in the background. And the gentleman there in the purple with the cross is the Episcopal Bishop of the Rio Grande Diocese, which is for New Mexico and part of Texas as well. And um, this is a, a great project that is actually done through an LLC. So the community um, joined together to buy in to get this project. Um, you may be aware that faith communities um, cannot use tax credits. So they have to be very creative in doing the financing. And so we have a number of variety of uh, success stories in how people have done that. And this is a, another one of those great success stories. Um, we also work with uh, Native American people and a lot of cultural diversity. These are some of our Navajo friends. And uh, the woman in the center with the sunglasses is a Marian old sister. And she's from the Catholic um, Diocese of Gallup, New Mexico. And um, the sister on the end is a Mercy sister I live with, and then I, my two Navajo friends. So with the Navajo people and the Pueblos in this particular region, we're addressing some legacy issues of uranium mining, even at the same time that we're addressing climate change and moving towards solar. Sister Rosemary was very significant working with faith leaders to get a project called Gallup Solar, where uh, they are installing solar panels on uh, native homes, many of the Navajo do not have electricity or running water. We are also pleased to be working with the Episcopal um, Church of Navajo land just more recently and uh, working towards energy efficiency and solar with them as well on their institutional buildings and their people's homes. And with them also, they're very, very engaged in the policy advocacy because they have a legacy history of uh, dealing with the pollution from coal-fired power plants um, the uranium issue that still is not cleaned up, and the oil and gas industry, which is also affecting water, which is very, very precious, and their health. So on all those fronts, we're involved with them. We were um, part of the many marches last fall, uh, coinciding with the one in New York, and this is one in Santa Fe at the cathedral. You'll see on the one side um, the priest from the cathedral there blessing the beginning of this 
um, March with an interfaith prayer service. Um, I might note that we had one of these in Albuquerque, but also more recently, when the Pope came, we had seven different um, prayer services throughout the state, including in some very um, more conservative areas. And so it was just quite wonderful, and we always connect it with some kind of action. So at these, more recently, we were getting um, people to sign on to support the Green Climate Fund and um, locally um, renewable energy tax credit. Here's another solar rooftop um, uh, um, installation, and this is a blessing. Um, this is Father Chavez. He's wearing his cowboy hat, which is pretty typical for our region, for our state. And the principal of this school, uh, Donna Illerbrin, is quite wonderful. This is a poor school, economically poor, but they raised the money for this. She has done amazing things with energy efficiency and solar, and now gardening, and their latest project is to get rid of asphalt. And um, here we have a, a number of uh, faith leaders um, who came to testify at a public regulatory commission to um, diminish, to eventually move out of a coal-fired power plant that we are dealing with in our state um, in, into renewable clean energy. And just wonderful group of people. And my final slide is, these are the Norbertine priests, and they are marvelous. And they just dedicated their Pope Francis solar field right as uh, the encyclical Laudate Si came out. And um, they, before that, had done all kinds of water efficiency, energy efficiency, and they have a, a parish also where they installed solar and did all those energy efficiency things. And there, at the parish, they installed uh, 300 solar panels. Again, these are not wealthy areas, but they feel that this is the moral obligation. It is the obligation for the future, for the children, that we do these things. So we're very proud, pleased, and, and love doing this work. So I'm back again, and I hope I can get you as excited about our next little step as we are. Everybody kind of gets the notion that, okay, you take a pledge, you come to COP, you go away with an agreement, and then it stops. We have announced a Paris pledge. We announced it almost a year ago. People started signing up for it in about February. And over the last 10 months, over we're close to 5,000 people who have signed the Paris pledge. There are 300 congregations within that 5,000. And the pledge is that the congregations who, who take the pledge and the individuals who take it will cut their carbon footprint 50% by 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2050. It's, those are big cuts. Those are bigger cuts than what the United States pledged for this conference. We didn't come to shame the nations of the world. We came to simply say, we in the faith community in America can do this. Some of our congregations are already carbon neutral, and it's hugely exciting to show that we can create jobs, we can save money, and we can save creation all at the same time. If the U.S. Faith Department can do this, I mean, the, the United States, yes, faith communities can do this, certainly the governments can. And I want, we're going to present to a member of the State Department, Karen Florini, who is responsible largely for us being here today with the Paris Pledge, with the 5,000 signatures and the congregations. This is um, a document we brought from San Francisco, and Karen is here to receive it. And Karen is the uh, Deputy Envoy for Climate Change at the U.S. State Department, so she's uh, Todd Stern's deputy. Wow. And that writing is tiny, there, and it's 11 feet long. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all so much. We're going to turn to some uh, question and answer now as they get that all rolled back up again. 
that's just quite a demonstration of how many people signed that it's going to take you, I think, several seconds to even get it back in place. So thank you very, very much for all that. And, and thank you also for bringing the photos and showing us really uh, what communities are doing. Because I think, that, you know, they say a photo's worth a thousand words. And I think that's really true. It's, it's great to actually see how this is playing out all over the world. Uh, if I can uh, ask you to take your seats. And you have some microphones there. I just want to kick you off with a, an, an introductory question, and then we'll turn to the audience, so get your questions ready. Um, one of the key phrases in your campaign is interfaith. And I think that really came through in the presentation. You talked about Jewish congregations. You talked about uh, indigenous uh, religions with the Navajo and others. And I just wanted to ask um, how that process worked to really bring multiple faiths together. Were there any challenges you had to sort of work through with that? And, and what, did you, what was your approach that was most effective in making this really an interfaith initiative? You can use those microphones. Well, thank you for that. Microphones um, right there. The interesting thing about this has been the U.S. faith community has been hungry to get involved in a movement like this, and we have not had to put pressure on anyone. They come to us, and they come to us from all these different denominations once they have... It started out in the Episcopal Church, and I know you heard Episcopal over and over again. Um, we had a leadership role in getting it started, but in 2002, we started getting calls from the Presbyterians. Can we join this program, or is it just for Episcopalians? And pretty soon, there were Jews, Muslims, evangelicals and Roman Catholics. And what we hope is, through presentations like this, that people will hear about the work in whatever denomination they're involved in and get involved with us. Every single one of the mainstream religions has a mandate to care for creation. They have not had a vehicle or the resources on how to do that until we were able to provide them. So it's essentially, when you asked what the challenges, there haven't been challenges. That's what's so extraordinary. They are coming to us, they're hungry for the information, and um, it's been really a, a joy. Um, that's a great question. And um, as Sally said, you know, there is a great deal of excitement around this. And like in New Mexico, for instance, we have uh, members who are Sikh and Buddhist and Muslim and Jewish, Catholic, um, Protestant, um, you know, all of those. Um, for us in New Mexico, though, I have to say there, there are some challenges in this in terms of cultural diversity and um, spiritual diversity, say with our indigenous brothers and sisters is one example. So... In, uh, in the cultural, uh, in, in some, historically sometimes, religions have been out there kind of oppressing and even taking land from our native brothers and sisters and all. So this is really what's wonderful about this project. It's an opportunity for healing. And we're finding that very much so. So kind of taking the lead from them, what are their concerns, what are their needs, how do they want to move with this? And then so with that kind of invitation, uh, entering into who they are. And I, I would say that that's probably true, maybe not to the same extent, but with um, I interfaith. It's like there has, we, we have to be very sensitive to the diversity and of uh, each of these traditions and listening. And, but it's a great partnership and wonderful, and it's modeling um, what can happen worldwide with our diversity working together so closely. I would just add the only challenge we've had is that faith traditions can get a little bit competitive with each other. Um, we have um, one of our Baha'i friends here, Peter Adrians, and when we have a preach-in every year where we ask all of our congregations all over the country to preach a sermon on climate change on the same weekend of the year, the Baha'is are always a leader, and when we tell our Presbyterian friends, wow, the Baha'is are really ahead of you guys, and you have a lot more churches, they're like, what? Well, we, we want to get more Presbyterians involved. And the Catholics and the Jews and the Muslims, it's really wonderful to see everybody coming together in support of a common cause. So the interfaith work has really been one of the most unexpectedly, um, because we didn't start out just to work interfaith, uh, rewarding things about this program. Okay, well, uh, I guess we will jump right into the questions. And I have one more framing one, but I'll ask it after we uh, ask yours. 
we'll take two for you all, okay? Thank you, thank you so much. Doris Marlin, Unitarian Universalists, and thank you so much for your work. As um, one of the, the smaller denominations in the U.S., it's been so wonderful to join with Interfaith Power and Light on all of our actions that we do for climate change, advocate, climate change solutions advocacy. And my question is, is there an, a possibility of doing even more advocacy um, through Interfaith Power and Light, which has kind of been more along the lines of helping um, congregations convert to gr a greener energy, but not necessarily getting out front and sitting down and talking and with with um, con with um, congressional representatives and and more on, more along those lines. Thank you. Okay, and just we're just going to take one more so you can answer both at the same time. I'm Bill McPherson, also with Unitarian Universalists. And I want to just make two points and, and uh, turn it over to you to sort of respond. One is we do have a branch of Interfaith Power and Light, as you know, called Earth Ministry in Washington State. And we're very active with the legislature. And we now have the governor's climate plan and a carbon tax. We're both uh, supporting those. So that's the kind of act activism that we can conduct in the churches in Washington State. Then on the local level, I'm talking about my own congregation, University Unitarian Church, and we're rebuilding the sanctuary and some of the offices, and it's all going to be built on a green plan, not necessarily lead, but trying to go to that, that standard. And we have a climate action team in the church, and we have been involved right from the beginning. So that's, I think, how we can bring congregations locally into all of this. If you could respond to that, please. So first question was on how to conduct more active advocacy and influence perhaps uh, influence policy, inf influence Congress and other local decision makers. Second uh, was an example of local action and just your response to uh, influencing state actions at the policy level all the way down to the, the congregational action level? Well, let me start with the advocacy. Um, we are, as a 5013, a little limited on how much time we can spend with lobbying and direct advocacy. We do do as much as we can, and Susan is really our policy expert, but we visit our state legislators, the state folks, the New Mexico people go, the Illinois people go in to see their state legislators when they're at home in their area and talk to them about all the bills that have to do with energy efficiency and cutting carbon emissions. At the national level, we have one day a year when we gather in Washington with all the state affiliates, go to Washington, we spend three days there on, at our conference, and the third day we go to the Hill and we visit our legislators. And the religious leaders of whatever denomination that they come from wear their religious garb. So that if we're visiting with a, um, a, a Jewish legislator, we send the rabbi in. If we're visiting with a Roman Catholic, we send our priests in. And we have found that it very often a legislator will say, we have been visited on these issues about pollution by the health community, by labor, by the Sierra Club, but we've never had a religious leader come in and talk about this from a moral perspective. And that's what's been hugely exciting for us, and we also find that we've had an influence. We've had feedback from some of these legislators and also a CEO of a coal company who let the people in Indiana know that that was the influence that encouraged them to retire their coal plant 18 years ahead of time. So we know that bringing religious voices and moral responsibility into the conversation with legislators is tremendously helpful. And Susan, do you want to say a little more about that? Or, and then take the question about at the state level. Yeah. I'll just add to that that 
Um, recently, um, what we've been working on most uh, of all in terms of public policy is supporting the Clean Power Plan. We've been really encouraged uh, by the administration's action, the EPA's action, on setting, finally, uh, mandatory limits on power plants around the country, the, the number one source of emissions uh, in the United States. So we've had people turn out at public hearings, people of faith comment. We showed the slide with people, with one of our leaders delivering a box of 10,000 comments in support of the Clean Power Plan uh, to the EPA administrator. So we generally find one or two things each year that we really want to put most of our energy behind that we think will make the biggest difference in terms of policy. And also at the state level, we do lots of, uh, lots of work uh, on, and kind of varies depending on which state. I think Washington State is one of our most active uh, states in terms of really leading uh, on policy at the state level. And New Mexico has done quite a lot too. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so well, the beauty about Interfaith Power and Light is that there are these wonderful campaigns at the uh, national level that address the federal that everybody can engage in, and then it's also geared towards regionally or statewide, whatever is appropriate and strategic to get engaged in. So for instance, in New Mexico, we had, you know, we've been involved with the Clean Power Plan. More recently, we have gotten a lot of signatures, comments, and faith leaders signing onto a letter in support of the EPA methane rules, because our state is tremendously affected by that. Um, we've done similar kinds of things with renewable energy tax credit. Um, when Pope Francis came out with Laudato Si, we had over 100 faith leaders sign a letter that we then gave to our um, New Mexico legislators and our governor, who is not so supportive of some of these things, um, in support of Laudato Si, but connecting it to the Green Climate Fund, to renewable energy tax credits. And we also visited our um, federal legislators. So it, it's kind of the strategy of whatever works in the states and, it's, um, in, and is effective. Okay, a couple more questions and comment from Karen. I'm Karen Florini, the Deputy Climate Envoy for the State Department. It was a real privilege and a pleasure to receive this scroll. I'm gonna make one very brief comment and then ask a question. The comment is just to make sure that folks are aware that not all engagement with legislators it constitutes lobbying for uh, the technical under the technical definition, and I think it might be helpful to, to maybe make sure that there's a little bit of information on that about that. Uh, some links, perhaps, on the IPL um, website. The question that I wanted to ask is: I'm I'm sad to say there is a name missing from this, which is mine. Not that I have actually because I haven't signed up yet, and I'm so my question is: Is this still open for signature? And if so, how does one do so? That is, I'm so glad you asked that question because that was one of the points we definitely wanted to make this morning, which is this is our ongoing response to climate change. This is what we expect to go on for a number of years, and we hope that if, well, hopefully we won't have to have come to another COP <laughs> very, very soon, but that we can add thousands more signatures to that. In fact, we've picked up a few while we're here. And, and we will be checking in on these congregations that took the pledge and see how they're doing. And can people sign up online, or how do they do that? www.parispledge.org. That's easy. Okay, another question right here. Yes, good morning. Peter Adrians with the Baha'i Community of the United States. It's been such a pleasure to work with Interfaith Power and Light. We've done it for several years. We've had some uh, really great activities that the Baha'is have been involved in. And uh, it's great to know the Baha'is have been a source of inspiration to other faith groups, because many faith groups, of course, are inspirations to us as well. Um, my question is this. We've been at the COP. We've seen the presence of a lot of faith communities. Uh, the faith communities have played an active role here. All of us are going home, and we have the obligation, really, to share the message of the COP and what we've done here with others. What is Interfaith Power and Light planning post-COP? in terms of communications with the broad American public? Well, the first thing we want to do is to follow up with our congregations that are on that scroll uh, and individuals that have taken the Paris Pledge and let them know that their names were delivered here uh, in Paris and 
continue to support them in meeting their commitments that they've made because they're quite ambitious commitments to cut their emissions in half by 2030. Um, we're creating resources and raising funds to support them to be able to meet those goals and also to celebrate them when they do reach those goals. It's a source of inspiration to all of us when we see a congregation uh, put solar on the rooftop as we've seen with lots of celebrations and also when we have congregations do things like reach carbon neutrality or even go carbon negative, which we have one congregation already that is producing more clean energy than they're using. So these are the kind of things we want to continue to support and to celebrate when they happen. And then as Sally said, keep the Paris Pledge open. If you haven't signed up yet, it's not too late. Please do sign up. We want to keep this momentum going, um, just as I think the, the negotiators in the COP are talking about the importance of of really Paris being a beginning and not an end in terms of our response uh, to climate change. And we know that more is needed, so we'll continue to work on that. And I also want to encourage anybody who's not involved or would like more information to take one of these fact sheets about Interfaith Power and Light. Um, we're in 40 states around the country. Um, you can find out who your representative is uh, from your state, or if your state hasn't had an Interfaith Power and Light presence yet, maybe you'd like to start one. Um, so those, those fact sheets are right there um, on the white shelf as you leave, and there are a few more here. And one other part, Peter, you asked about what will be the messaging going forward. Until we know the end result of what happens while we're here, we can't say for sure, but I would say that in the, in the big picture, it's gonna be tremendously positive. And that, as you say, the faith community has been well represented here, and we can say to our folks that we're actually taking a leadership role again in a big movement and that it'll be hopefully happening all over the world. And there are people here, we didn't mention, but we have a program where we're supporting reforestation and planting of trees in the developing world with four different projects that are connected to the faith community. Those folks are here. And so all over the world, I, I'm hoping, at least with the faith response, is that this has been a tremendously positive meeting and that we're all inspired. We can always do more and continue the movement, but that generally it's been positive. Okay, and this is your last chance to hashtag Ask US Center online. So get your questions in online. This is your last chance and another round of questions. Karen Florini from the State Department again. Pardon me for a brief commercial announcement, which is both my office, the Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change, and at the State Department, the, religious, the Office of uh, Religion and Global Affairs, I've been very actively engaged with the faith community. We sponsored uh, jointly with Georgetown University uh, Faith and Climate Symposium, um, I guess it was just last month still, um, coming out of the COP going forward, we very much want to continue to engage the faith community around issues of climate change um, through our colleagues at IP, uh, Interfaith Power and Light and many other organizations and institutions. So if there are opportunities for that you think would be useful to have State Department engagement on, please do be in touch with us and we are more than happy to follow up with you on that. Hi, I'm Judy Fenwick from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and um, I'm actually here representing um, Reverend Deborah Warner, who had to fly home today, although I'm not one of her congregants. Um, I, I am, I, I'm not a religious person, but I believe, um, but I am a big baseball fan. And so um, I was doing some numbers. Um, you have approximately 52 home games a year in churches, correct? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know what the size of the, um, the international, you know, if you have numbers on how many people you're touching when you have those home games. But I would just like to run some numbers by you. And unfortunately, this is very um, American-centric. So there are 30 Major League Baseball teams. They have approximately 80 home games a year. And let's say the average attendance is 20,000, because the Red Sox sell out every year. But that's 48 million people. And I'm wondering if fluorescent light bulbs could be handed out at every single home game, and I'm sure the Major League Baseball teams would support this, and let them go on your handle a little bit, you know, maybe Major League Power and Light. Um, and I think that's the way you get behavioral change big time, but 
what you're doing is underscoring the lead, and I think that's really valuable. So, I mean, I don't know what kind of an alliance you could forge with Major League Baseball, but, and then there's rugby and football, and <laughs> anyway, we'll just let, the, let that go. In some, in some homes, those are uh, other types of religions as well, as we know. Okay, one more question. Um, hello, my name is Julia Grundon welsh and I'm with the Brahma Kumaris. Um, I was very interested to hear what you're doing. Um, I heard an interview with um, Obama, and he was saying, President Obama, and he was saying that um, they're doing everything they can from their end, and the importance of raising awareness. So I can see that you're doing a very good job with that. I have one question. I noticed that when you were doing your presentation, you were talking about the importance of educating your communities in food and having fresh produce at your gatherings. Have you um, also considered vegetarianism? Do you bring that up at all with your communities? Because um, that is one of the major contributors to um, climate change. Okay, well, in the Cool Harvest program, we suggest that people eat less meat, and if at all possible, none. We do recognize that there's an enormous problem with agric animal agriculture. Um, it's, it's part of the Cool Harvest program, is to make that suggestion. And any uh, comments on uh, innovative solutions, new, new partnerships, let's say, or expansions of interfaith power and light? Um, well, we don't have a sponsor in Major League Baseball yet, but that would be great. <laughs> Um, we did once have a little league team that made t-shirts <laughs> with interfaith power and light. Um, but as you asked how many uh, congregations we and how many people we reach, we reach total about 18,000 congregations in the United States. So we estimate over 6 million people um, uh, coming to our home games on a weekly basis. So we do have a big reach. and. Uh, we'd like to reach even more, though. As I mentioned before, the U.S. faith community is quite large. Um, so we're aiming to get up to 30,000 congregations over the next few years. Okay, last round of questions. Last round of questions. And I'm just checking online to see if we have any there. Not just yet. Okay. Did I have one more? Okay, one and one. Um, I'm David Tucker with the Unitarian Universalist Association and just want to say thank you again to all of you for being here for the panel and all of your hard work uh, that you continue to do on, on climate change. Um, my question is, is this, I, I imagine that whatever agreement is reached today, tomorrow, Sunday, uh, there will be those of us inside and outside the faith community who will be happy, who will be excited, who will be disappointed, who will have concerns and worries and so on. And, I think across interfaith lines, one of our opportunities and one of our responsibilities as people of faith is to help people in a realistic, in a grounded way to find hopefulness and to help keep the movement uh, going forward towards climate change justice. And, and it's all too easy for people to give in to despair. And so I just wonder what you can say about how interfaith power and light, how all people of faith in the U.S. and around the world can focus on that in a, in a realistic and a grounded way. Thank you. We'll take one more. Hi, I'm uh, Gwen Ruda with Environmental Defense Fund. I just wanted to say as a member of the NGO community that uh, you know, what you guys are doing is so incredibly important to bring those, those voices to the, um, to the argument. And as an individual, I'm listening to the story and, and really inspired by it. But I have to maybe confess that it's probably not going to be enough to get me to a church. Um, so my question is, <laughs> um, are there messages that you find that work with the faith community that we can use, so people like me can use with my secular friends that would bring them still to the right side of this issue? Well, sure. Uh, one of the fastest growing um, segments of the population in the United States is spiritual but not religious. Maybe that um, resonates with you. We certainly have a lot of people that we reach who I think um, understand the moral message and really want to take action um, from that, from their, their values. So whether or not you attend church every week or at all, uh, you still have moral values. And I think 
that is a really deep and important way to engage with people, and we're working to do that through our, through our literature and our programs to involve individuals as well as faith communities. So we do have um, people who are unaffiliated in our network for sure, and you're welcome to be involved. Um. When we've done presentations, I have been asked, I don't attend a major religion service on any kind of a regular basis, if ever, does that mean I'm not a moral person? Because we often talk about moral responsibility. And I think in response to that question, though, is that, as Susan is alluding to, everybody has values. And our message, hopefully, is a values-based message. What do we care about? What kind of a future are we leaving to, the, to uh, our children and grandchildren? And, and what is our relationship with each other? And for the religious people, we're called to love our neighbors and serve the poor. For a socially responsible, moral person, it's the same values. So certainly, we can talk to folks about um, clean air, clean water. Don't you want your children and don't you want your neighbors to be able to go out and breathe the air and not have fear of getting asthma or drink the water and not have fear of being of having a toxic reaction. And those are things that we all care about. So certainly we can talk to moral people that have values that are not necessarily part of a mainstream religion. And Joe? No, 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 no. Are you finished? Um, so both questions, the one about hope and this one about people who are not in a re traditional religious tradition. And that one first, um, I think Pope Francis has been a marvelous, marvelous um, witness opportunity in many ways because his, his encyclical was open to the entire world. And um, there is someone who um, I have uh, connected with, or he's connected with me, who is an atheist. And he is with the Aldo Leopold Society. He wanted to get together to talk with me about the encyclical because he was making, he had read it all, better than a lot, some Catholics, I shouldn't say all, but some. And um, he was making comparisons with Aldo Leopold's uh, land ethics, earth ethics, and Laudato Si, and he wanted to talk about that. So I think that the tent is open and big, and I think going to the question of hope, I think this spiritual dimension, however it's defined, many, many people are hungering for that, looking for that. We are on uh, the road through Paris, beyond Paris, with Paris now, and um, that is a long, long journey. And it's going to require uh, a, a deep, to, to dig down into the very, very deep places within ourselves for, for nourishment, for hope, for hope in a realistic manner, um, strength to uh, continue forward. And that's uh, very significant, and I believe that um, people of religious traditions, spiritual persuasions, offer that for the entire world um, without judgment of whatever belief you have or don't have. And it's quite critical, I think, in the element of hope. Any final words, Reverend Bingham? Well, my final word is <laughs> keep the faith, keep the hope, and uh, we will tackle this problem and each one of us has a responsibility to do our part and if we do our part and we can change the way we behave the politics will follow and I think that was one of the messages that Pope Francis had that if we can change the hearts and the minds of people the politics will change as well thank you one round of applause for our presenters Thank you. As they step down, I encourage you to just take your seats or keep your seats for two minutes. We're going to show our Action Day video for one final time that talks about the faith community, the business community, and all sorts of other communities in the U.S. that uh, are taking action on climate change. Americans are moving forward, not only as it relates to their commitment to making a difference on climate change, but they're moving forward in the individual decisions that they're making in their daily lives. We are seeing some positive signs of progress, but it really takes significant efforts to create a good outcome. It feels like a daunting challenge, but on the other side of the ledge of any challenge becomes a very large opportunity. 
This is not a situation that the business can solve, or the government can solve, or academia can solve. You have to get everyone together to do it. And it is that combined effort to make sure that together we're catalyzing the opportunities out there. Climate change is a moral issue. Fundamentally, it's a moral issue. The faith community has been very engaged in trying to address climate change because it's part of what we want to do as mandated by God. Climate change is the threat for the future. So if I want to be true to my faith, then I have to do something about it. There is tremendous concern about climate change. You know, there's a desire to participate in solutions. We've definitely seen an increase in individual Americans being interested in switching to clean power, not just for their households, but also for their businesses. Greenbelt Climate Action Network educates members of the community and encourages them to take action, whether it be personal, city level, county level, state, or federal. We've encouraged people to do lobbying, and we've even qualified as an EPA green power community for having over 3% of our population on renewable energy. Every community needs to be thinking about what is the impact on my community of climate change and how am I going to you know, make sure that my community adapts for the future. You know, our Rebuild by Design plan to comprehensively protect really is, is a model for other communities. We will be protecting our entire community, all of the residents, all of the businesses, all of the critical infrastructure. That's what we're talking about. Many of the solutions that we actually bring and harness to tackle climate change bring us with it lots of different co-benefits, not only in terms of reducing much of the public health and societal spillovers, but also help us harness new technology and bring technology innovation. As an energy consumer, we believe that renewable energy can be cheaper than traditional forms of energy. But long term, we view the benefits of bringing technology to the market as creating substantial opportunities for Google and many other companies around the world. It's both a business imperative and a human imperative. The commitments that we make around sustainability are exactly that. They're commitments that are going to help us still function and operate and be a good business partner well into the future. The only way the world gets better is that we all have a role to play and all of us have to participate in order for our goals to be successful. If only a few companies participate, if only a few individuals participate, we're never going to get to where we need to be as a world. And someday our children and our children's children will look at us in the eye and they'll ask us, did we do all that we could when we had the chance to deal with this problem and leave them a cleaner, safer, more stable world? And I want to be able to say, yes, we did. Don't you want that?